This is a mini lecture on pulmonary hypertension as well as an introduction to mechanical ventilation. My name is Ruthann Skinner and I'm an acute care nurse practitioner and educator. This PowerPoint was created by Gail Tucker and Ruthann Skinner. Pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is increased pulmonary vascular resistance, increased pulmonary pressure, such as left ventricular failure, and increased pulmonary blood flow with a left to right shunt. Symptoms include shortness of breath during routine activities, tiredness, chest pain, a racing heartbeat, pain on the upper right side of the abdomen, and decreased appetite. Because these symptoms are so vague, it may take up to two years from the complaint to have a complete diagnosis. Additionally, the diagnosis may be an incidental finding when doing an echo. Physical exam findings include jugular venous distension, peripheral edema, knowing that Raynaud's and systemic sclerosis is associated with pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is defined as a mean arterial pressure greater than 25 at rest. Gold standard for diagnosis is per the right heart catheterization. The RA pressure is greater than 20 equals a poor prognosis. Pulmonary pressures can be approximated per the echocardiogram and is considered a screening tool for those at high risk. High risk includes a first degree relative with pulmonary hypertension, exposures to toxins, CHF, and cirrhosis. Additionally, due to the hypoxemia, polysemia may be identified. BNP is consistently elevated and greater than 180. This indicates a right heart strain. However, you should use caution because a false positive, including left heart failure, sepsis, age greater than 70, renal failure, and GFR greater less than 60. 90% of patients with pulmonary hypertension will have an abnormal chest x-ray. Plain imaging features an elevated cardiac apex due to the right ventricular hypertrophy, enlarged right atrium, a prominent pulmonary outflow tract, enlarged pulmonary arteries, and pruning of the peripheral pulmonary vessels. The World Health Organization has created classifications. Group one is the pulmonary hypertension and includes idiopathic primary pulmonary hypertension drug-induced, as well as associated with conditions such as HIV, collagen disorders, and portal hypertension. Group 2, pulmonary venous hypertension, includes left-sided systolic, diastolic, or valvular heart disease. Group 3, pulmonary hypertension associated with lung disease and or chronic hypoxia, includes COPD, ILD, Restrictive, restrictive lung disease, OSA, chronic exposure to high altitudes. Group four is pulmonary hypertension due to chronic embolytic and thrombotic disease. Additionally, the WHO group five includes miscellaneous pulmonary hypertensions of unclear or multifactorial mechanisms, such as hematological, systemic causes, metabolic, metabolic causes, or tumor compression. Patients with pulmonary hypertension can benefit from oxygen, systemic anticoagulation, digoxin, and diuresis. For additional treatment, you must know the classification of the pulmonary hypertension to guide your treatment. Treatment for all of the groups except group 1 is really aimed at treating the underlying cause. Pharmacologic therapy is started for symptomatic patients in groups 2 through four. Prostacyclins inhibit smooth muscle proliferation and platelet aggregation. This can be delivered by inhalation, IV, or sub-Q. Calcium channel blockers are only approved by the FDA for idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, which is rare. Patients that have endothelial receptor antagonists must enroll in an educational access program. Additionally, these patients should be considered for a lung transplant. 
the use of intubation and ventilation is common treatment for respiratory problems in the ICU. Ventilation is a mechanical movement of air into and out of the villi for the purpose of gas exchange. There are, sev there are several reasons why a patient needs to be ventilated. Disease conditions such as respiratory failure, sepsis, neuromuscular problems, or other acute conditions may warrant ventilation. It is also important for patients to be able to protect their airway due to a decreased mental status or lack of gag reflex. There can be hydrogenic complications such as ventilator associated pneumonia, oxygen toxicity, pneumothorax from barotrauma, and additional ventilator induced lung injury. Cardiac complications can include a decreased RV preload and an increased RV afterload. Increased ICP, fluid retention due to decreased Q, and a decreased renal blood flow. Patients oft often need sedation while on mechanic ventilation. This can also assist in coordinating patients with their ventilator synchrony. However, for some patients, they are difficult or unable to awaken from sedation, which significantly affects one's ability to do a complete neuroassessment. Sedation does not address pain issues, and intubations can be painful. It is also affects the patient's ability to communicate about their pain. Especially for long-term intubated patients, they are unable to move around, which causes atrophy and muscle weakness. ICU-related post-traumatic stress disorder is more common than actually reported. This is exacerbated by sedation and Ativan. Other challenges are specific to intubation, such as skin breakdown or erosion from the ET tube. Dysphagia after extubation, increase, incorrect intubation, or even equipment malfunction. Non-invasive ventilation supports the patient's breathing without the need for intubation or a tracheotomy. This is an alternative to intubation if the pa patient's code status does not allow intubation. It can be used for obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or acute congestive heart failure with pulmonary edema. However, non-invasive ventilation is contraindicated in acute respiratory distress, uncooperative patients, the inability to protect airway or burn or trauma patients to the face because of the secondary edema making it difficult to intubate layer. Positive end expiratory pressure, or the PEEP, prevents a velar collapse and associated lung injury. A minimum of five centimeters water pressure can be raised to improve oxygenation with diffuse conditions such as pulmonary edema and ARDS. There are, there are several ventilator modes to meet the needs of the patient. Differentiation is made between mandatory and spontaneous breathing methods. During volume controlled ventilation, the set tidal volume is supplied by the ventilator at a constant flow. The value controlled and kept at this target volume by the equipment is called the tidal volume. The tidal volume and the number of mandatory breaths per minute can be adjusted. Continuous mandatory ventilation, or CMV, is now one of the standard modes of ventilation. Other modes can be used at other times. During pressure-controlled ventilation, two pressure levels are kept, the lower pressure level of PEEP and the upper pressure level. The volume and the decelerating flow are the resulting variables and can vary dependent on changes in the lung mechanisms. In pressure-controlled ventilation, or PCV, the ventilator determines inspiratory time without the patient's participation. If ventilators and ventilator modes are new to you, I would encourage investigation and understand the differences. After the patient is intubated, criteria for extubation should be continually monitored. Criteria for extubation should be assessed daily after the patient has been stabilized with the goal of extubation as early and safest as possible. A re-intubation rate of 5 to 15 percent is actually considered standard. However, currently, 15 percent of all patients in the ICU fail extubation. 
although there are several criteria for extubation, there are several components to keep in mind. Are we out of the acute respiratory distress phase? And is the oxygenation adequate? In most ICUs, respiratory therapists will help assist and identify patients that might be ready. A part of this process is transitioning the patient to a CPAP mode to determine if the patient is able to maintain their own oxygenation, especially without distress. Therefore, evaluating hemodynamic stability, fever, and other changes is an important variable in determining readiness. Another consideration is their neurological status. Do they have the capacity to maintain their airway and independently breathe? With continuing evidence-based research, providers can perform the best care with the best outcomes. Thank you for listening.